Welcome to the sixth talk of the uh, 2021 uh, Winter Speaker Series hosted by the Nepean Sailing Club. My name is Park Davis, and I'm going to be your MC again tonight. That way. Uh, as you know, uh, Greg Johnson was going to talk tonight about uh, life above 20, 20 knots, and I guess it's also life above the waves because uh, he's going to talk about foiling sailboats. Now, unfortunately, uh, Greg uh, wasn't available tonight. So we're happy to have in his place, uh, David Bradley, and he's gonna speak about uh, sales and foiling as well. Almost the same topic, but from a, an entirely different slant, he's, his topic is titled, Go Fast, Don't Die. And it's the new and improved and updated 2021 version of a talk he gave uh, once before uh, to the uh, people in the PN Sailing Club and others at the Winter Speaker Series. Now, according to Dave's bio, he said he started sailing at a very early age, maybe four years old, with his dad in the UK, and he hated every minute of it. But things change, and uh, Dave now has raced all sorts of boats, and he's loved them all, and he loves sailing. His races have spanned the globe, and he's gone uh, uh, racing uh, from Australia on the one side, the Sydney Hobart race, uh, to the UK, uh, the Fastnet race from uh, Cows to Fastnet Rock, around that and back to Plymouth. He started the first uh, viable skiff racing fleet here in Ottawa back in 2002, and he brought the first foiling sailboat to Ottawa in 2010. And he got back into foiling boats last year and or two years ago in 2019 with a class A catamaran. Uh, Dave is a retired engineer and he also volunteers uh, here at NSC as the public relations director. Uh, now, last week we were going to say that Greg Johnson's boat boats that he was going to talk about, they're, they're not your father's sailboats. And I think entirely the same thing can be said about Dave's talk and Dave's boats that he's going to be talking about tonight. There aren't your father, they aren't your father's sailboats. So David, I'll turn things over to you and let you go from here. That's great, Park. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, making time to, to join us on this presentation. Um, and, uh, and thank you, Park, for that introduction. So, Without further ado, I'm going to jump in and just roll a, uh, an intro video uh, and I'll chat over that so that we have something interesting to look at as we're, as we're rolling through. Um, so just bear with me one second. There we go. So what we're seeing here is, is a montage of all sorts of foiling boats. Um, you know, not your dad's sailboat. Well, some of these have been around for a while. Um, foiling is not actually that new. Uh, we're seeing all sorts of things here from the America's Cup. Um, oops, um, all sorts of stuff going on. It is a very interesting and high speed from a development point of view area to be sailing. Um, you know, when you're going this fast and you're pushing the envelope and you're on the, some would call it bleeding edge, you know, bad things can happen, but also great things can happen. And I've thoroughly enjoyed throwing myself to the bottom of the learning curve uh, when I'm certainly well over 30 and enjoying every minute of it. Um, being humbled very often, but learning lots and having a great time. Um, these new boats are a challenge for sure. And it does involve changing the way that you look at sailing and how you, how you behave when you're sailing. Um, but once you get into the mindset of foiling and how to do it, uh, it's actually a very simple uh, set of parameters that you're going to sail within. Uh, that's not so good walking on water, but anyway, there's all sorts of different ways to do it. So as Park said, I, I, I bought a moth back in 2010, one of the Gen 2 early generation foiling moths. Um, I swam around that boat for about a year and a half, um, didn't really have a great time, did learn a little bit but realized that my window of opportunity for that particular boat had long since closed uh, from a physical point of view. You know, you needed to be made of rubber and, and 20 years old and, and sailing on an ironing board on its edge was not terribly interesting. Um, so I got back into, into my 14, onto my 49er uh, and carried on high speed, high performance skiff sailing. 
Um, and as time went on, I realized that the skiff sailing was really pretty tough, uh, tough physically. Um, and and uh, I wasn't really prepared to continue doing that um, and putting my body through that. So surprising though it may seem, sailing on a foiling boat, particularly on a catamaran, is actually remarkably easy on your body compared to a high performance uh, planing boat. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit as, as we go through. Uh, what you're seeing here is a selection, as I said, a bunch of the, the NACRA uh, 17s, there's um, the Essentials, the FP Essentials, some of the dinghies, obviously American Magic, we all know what happened to them. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit. Uh, this is going back to the previous America's Cup uh, when pitch bowling was a thing. And if you do that and you do it badly, things break. Um, you can foil a laser. Uh, this is not a difficult thing to get into. It's not too hard to find an entry point uh, for where you want to be. There's also an exit point really well captured. Um, so what I'm gonna to try to cover in this is really my introduction, very personal story about how I got into foiling, why I'm doing it, and what my path looks like um, in terms of improving and getting better and, and, and engaging in, in a particularly active fleet, the A-class catamaran fleet. Uh, there are lots of choices for foiling. Um, obviously, a lot of people are familiar with the Moth. Uh, that's been around for many years in, in different guises. Um, and now there are much more accessible foiling boats uh, for, let's say, the every man or every woman that can easily access this sport and, and get the most out of it. Um, you know, we see the America's Cup Yachts doing 50 knots on, on YouTube and on the TV, and you don't have to do 50 knots to foil. You can do 12 knots to foil. And the sensation and the feeling is just as much fun, and the crashes hurt a lot less when you're only doing 12 knots. Um, here we see at the end, don't even necessarily need a, a rig. Uh, there's the kite foilers are doing something which is spectacular. I've been doing that for a while. Here we see some more shots of A-class a catamarans. Uh, American Magic in its fateful capsize uh, when, when it holds itself. Team Ineos now also out of, out of the America's Cup. Uh, GP catamarans come in kits. You can buy them and ship them. And apparently they're robust enough to do that. Um, so you don't even need a sail. Paddleboard. Uh, can foil. Uh, kiteboarding, big, big deal, low, low price of entry, uh, and a very, very interesting and portable sport. Um, there is an event happening in Kingston uh, this summer. It's a multi-class, multi-foiling event. It's just a celebration of foiling, uh, COVID willing, obviously. Um, and we're going to be seeing the F-101, which is a new uh, trimaran, uh, that, is, that is being pitched by the foiling group down in Kingston. We'll see the Wasp, which is a version of a, of a, of a moth, kite foilers, windsurf foiling, and also uh, the ACATs are now going to have, have starts and clinics down there too. Um, and anybody else who wants to get into it, you know, they're very, very open, a good group of people. Um, so that's kind of the intro, intro movie. Um, what I'm going to do now is I will go to my presentation and share that. Uh, and then we can get into the slides. All right. So my presentation called Go Fast, Don't Die. Um, it actually has a little bit of a story to it. It was a saying that my grandma used to say to dad, to my dad. Um, my dad had a motorbike at a very early age and so did, so did my uncle, so his brother. And my, my gran was very realistic, she knew that they were going to go terrassing around the neighborhood doing whatever it was they wanted to do. So she actually said to them, go fast, don't die. None of this stuff about be careful, just go fast, don't die. And in between you could say have fun. So that's kind of, kind of where the, the impetus for that is. Um, here's a bit of a questionnaire. Uh, a lot of people have preconceptions about foiling and, and what it is and, and what it really means to do it. Take a look at these questions. Please feel free to answer them on the poll. There we go. Um, you know, who amongst the audience are sailors? Who likes to go fast? Have you ever foiled? You might be surprised as more of you have done that than you think. Um, do you want to? You know, and, and a lot of people, I get this all the time. It's a fad, it's not really sailing. Um, well, we're gonna cover some of that stuff as we go through, but please feel free to click on those, those buttons, uh, give us the answers. We do love to hear back what those are. If you have any questions associated with that, dump them in the question and answer window. We'd love to be interrupted as we're going through. 
Um, so please do take a minute to answer all those. Uh, just on the, the penultimate question, are you too old for this? Um, so the oldest competitive sailor in the North American A-class catamaran, I've met him, he's 84, okay? So I don't wanna hear any excuses, 84, and he's doing it. Now, he may not sail every race, he certainly isn't winning, but he doesn't capsize anymore. And he goes out when the wind suits him, but he is competing. He enters into the national events and he play, you know, he does okay. He doesn't finish last. Um, so anyway, the, you're, you're never too old to give something a try on your terms. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Um, we're gonna cover a little bit of, uh, a little bit, oh, here's some, some of the, uh, the, the results. So, okay, most of you sail, well, that's good. Most of you like to go fast. Very few of you have foiled. Okay, so I'm guessing I've got a couple of kite foilers in there, maybe Greg and some of the other folks on the catamarans, uh, maybe a moth sailor or two, uh, but lots of you want to. That is awesome. Um, hopefully through this presentation, I'm gonna be able to show you uh, just how accessible it is. It's really super easy to get into and you can do it at Nepean. You know, I remember bringing a skiff here, a twin wire, uh, uh, asymmetrical, uh, skiff here in 2001 and told that I couldn't sail it here because the water wouldn't support it, wouldn't be big enough. And, you know, since then we've had, I think now 15 or 16 skiff Grand Prix. We've had various skiff fleets come and go. We've had various catamaran fleets come and go. So it's it's really a, a, a very established form of, of, of sailing and you can make it happen. The theory, I will cover some of it. Yes, I'm a retired engineer. If you want to get into deep theory, we'll do that offline. Um, the feel of sailing and the feel of going fast is awesome. There's nothing like it, right? Um, and this is something that you know you you can actually experience. Uh, a lot of you say you can't afford it. You know, entry point, for example, for a, a foiling kite board rig used probably around a thousand bucks. Um, I bet you spend more than that on spare parts and bits and pieces for your boat to fix it up during the winter. So it's not as crazy expensive as you might think. Um, yeah, if you want to go and buy a brand new A-class catamaran that's that's fully decked out, yeah, you're talking probably 35k, uh, possibly more. Um, but you know, you don't need to start there. There's lots of other entry points. Okay, so we're going to get into some of that. A um, uh, quick bit of history. Um, like I said before, foiling is not new. Uh, this particular photograph, I think, I've, I think I've jumped forward one too many, but this particular photograph is about from about 1890. Uh, it's in one of the Swiss lakes up in the mountains, uh, and it's a powerboat that is foiling. So foiling is really, really not new. People established that it was a quicker way to travel across the water or through the water with less displacement mode sailing. Um, as you advance through sailing history, um, we see boats like Crossbow. Uh, Crossbow was a speed record holder. Uh, it traveled the world. It's a catamaran with twin, twin rigs, as you can see. Uh, and they started playing around with different kinds of foils and foil shapes on that boat uh, already to, to see where it would go. And then you get some really weird and wonderful stuff, right? Um, as you get up into the 80s, uh, that I think is a Hobie frame on top of I don't really know what. It looks like something you might buy at a Tupperware party. But anyway, um, you know, foiling is not new. Lots of people have had lots of really bad ideas about how to do it. Um, and then you jump forward and of course we realize that foiling is by far the fastest way to go across the water. Uh, power boats actually got there before sailboats did. Um, and, you know, we've been following in their footsteps and learning some new tricks and tips ourselves. Um, if we progress now into up into uh, uh, obviously America's Cup ideas as we go through, I put this one in there because ugly boats foil too. This is a scow, a lake scow, uh, a design that's probably over a hundred years old. Um, and you put enough horsepower up top, which is sails and people, and you put the right foils in the water, and guess what? You can get it to fly too. <clears throat> And then what we see here is, is some more familiar things from the previous America's Cup. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to be in Bermuda to watch these guys do their thing. Um, incredible time when you see these boats up close and you can hear the conversations and the, the things that are going on. 
and it is very much sailing. It is real sailing, let me tell you. There's all the same kind of calls that get made when they come into a windward mark uh, that you and I would make on a regular boat on a regular race night. Um, and then we get up to the, the most modern and the America's Cup boats that are, that are sailing right now. And the reason I put this in here from this particular shot, there are a lot more glamorous shots than, than this one. Um, but the idea is actually a catamaran, just kind of squint slightly at the photograph. And it's really a catamaran with a lifting windward foil. Now it has a single uh, rear rudder. It doesn't have twin rudders, but in terms of the balance, in terms of the writing moment, in terms of the lifting moment, it's exactly the same as the catamaran we saw in the previous photograph. So the ideas are, are developing um, and we're getting to stable foiling monohulls now, uh, which is a very interesting idea because the moth was definitely not stable. Um, so as I said, it's not new. It, it, it is hard. It, it can be really hard. Um, but it can also be incredibly rewarding and easy to get into. So I'm going to, I hope I'm going to be able to get this YouTube video to, uh, to show for you guys. And what we'll do is I need to share it. And we go here. Okay, so this is, um, I'm not sure you can see that. Apologies for this, it's all the technology, I think. Um, there we go. Um, so while we, uh, I'm not sure if you guys can see that, I'm, I think I'm hearing no, but um, full screen please. Okay, got it. <laughs> um, I have another question here that says, uh, does the increased speed take away from the tactical racing? Um, interesting question. Uh, no, it doesn't, because it's very important to figure out where the wind is. Um, you know, just like you do on a regular upwind or downwind leg, it's always looking for pressure, looking for where you can get that pressure. Um, if you're able to get up onto the foils, uh, there is a, a much bigger tendency to do what we call bang in the corner, if you like. Um, however, even when you're doing that, you've got to be very careful because when you are foiling, you're sailing on apparent wind. Okay, so you can see, I'm gonna pause this video, but you can see the, the, the wind on the water, it's probably eight to 10 knots. Uh, it's not really white capping. Um, Misha here, who is the current A-class world champion, uh, he is doing probably something like 20 to 22 knots downwind uh, in eight knots of breeze. Um, so it's very important that you do know where the puffs are. There is a real danger that once you get your apparent wind going, you can stay up on the foils and that's great. But when you jibe to come back, you're gonna drop down. There isn't the pressure there. There's maybe now only six knots of real breeze and that's not enough to get you back up on the foils and suddenly you are last. Um, so uh, yeah. So that's the uh, that's that's kind of the it is just as tactical and there are mark rounding issues there are lane management issues the starts uh, just the same kind of uh, questions that we that we always have to answer um, and what you see here Misha obviously very competent but quite comfortable really settling into it and he's foiling at about a height of two and a half two two and a half feet um, and he's not really flat wired out he's trimming the main as and when he goes. And you can see when he gets a gust, he'll basically bear away and, and uh, head up. Um, so now we're gonna go back to the presentation, which is here. Um, so the America's Cup, you know, talking about that, and the reason I asked the question, is it really a 911? 911 is a Porsche, uh, a, a very nice Porsche. Um, I have had the good fortune to drive one or two in my time. Um, but the 911, from an engineering point of view, is a rubbish idea. It's just an awful idea um, because putting the main mass of a car out behind the rear axle of the car is terrible for any kind of braking, cornering, handling. But if you take that idea and throw several hundred engineers at it for 60 or 70 years, you're probably going to end up with a pretty well-tuned version of that particular solution. And that's really where we've ended up with America's Cup. They change the deed of gift every year. They say, here are the new rules. This is what you can do. But really, it's that kind of 
effort to get to such a great boat. And if you watch the America's Cup through the Christmas races, the Prada Cup and, and the races that are coming up um, this, this time around, you'll see in the very beginning, they were learning how to sail the boats. They were learning how to tune the boats. They didn't even know what foils to put on. Now there's very little to choose between the boats, right? So they're developing super, super fast. Um, and I find that quite an exciting thing to, to, to do with these, so. Um, technical, everybody said they like technical. Uh, I got a few slides on it. I will start to whiz through them as we get closer to the end. Um, sailboats work in water and air. That's, that's what they do. They're considered as fluid. One's non-compressible, one's compressible. Water is about a thousand times denser than air. This is stuff everybody knows. Um, Drag anywhere is the enemy of sailing, of flight, of moving. Um, so your foils can have a very high lift and low drag if you build them right, and your hulls, if you build them wrong, can have no lift and very high drag. Um, and so what you end up with is potentially one of the weirdest boats I've ever seen. Uh, it's not really a boat. So you can see they got rid of the hull because it has high drag and you don't want it. Um, and the important thing is to get the foils working and they're sailing in about six or seven knots and they're foiling. Um, now it might look as if when this thing drops off the foils that it would sink, it doesn't. Uh, if you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but I'm highlighting the, the flotation pads on the wings that are each side. So it sits very low in the water, but it, it will sit stably on its, uh, let's call them training wheels on, on the wings. And then to get going, it gets towed to get going. They did this as a, as a proof of concept, but it kind of, takes to the extreme the idea that, well, the hull is really just a platform to hang your rig and your foils off once you're out of the water. Um, and that's exactly what that shows. Um, winglets is, are a big deal. So, you know, you hear people talk about T foils and L foils and J foils and all these other kind of fancy foils. Um, winglets are a really old concept uh, from the aerodynamic industry that basically says if you put a vertical end to a horizontal wing on a plane, then you effectively increase the wingspan of that plane without actually increasing the wingspan of the plane. And what it does is it stops all the, the, the good airflow from falling off the end of the, off the, end of the wing uh, when you're going forwards or when you're trying to go fast. Uh, so you improve the lift from a given size of wing and you improve the flow. Um, you know, different numbers mean different things depending on the on the medium that you're in and how fast you're going, but that's basically it. And we've all seen them, you know, maybe not on your own private Learjet, but certainly, you know, when when and if we're ever allowed to travel again, there are lots of winglets on, on commercial jets. It saves them a tremendous amount of fuel. Um, and here we see the winglets on the rudder of an A-class. Um, here the winglets are doing two things. They're improving the efficiency of the vertical foil um, so it allows the vertical foil to have more lift left and right or laterally up to windward or, or more lateral resistance. And also because we can control the angle of incidence on that foil, it allows you to control the lift directly up and down. Um, so slightly different uh, approach, but a similar idea. Uh, and this is how we measure it. You know, it's a nice little uh, <laughs> digital uh, pitch gauge from a radio controlled helicopter uh, blade and they just happen to clip really nicely onto the T-foils that we have and, and measure our angle of attack. Um, for the geeks out there, the rudders on these boats, very rarely are you putting them into anything more than about half a degree of lift. To lift the back of the boat up, you, you pull the front of the foil up, the back of the foil down, half a degree off of, off of horizontal for the, for the, for the, for the T-foil, that's all because any more than that, and it becomes a little bit unmanageable. And actually what you do is the windier it gets, you actually put some negative on there and you pull the boat down. Uh, we'll cover, cover that, why, cover why later. <clears throat> um, foils are not new. And as the very first photo showed, it, it, it was a power boat that's 130 years old. And power boats have been doing this forever. And they overcame the problem or any subtlety just by adding more engines. Um, well, we can do that in sailing too. We can make the rigs more efficient. We can put on bigger masts, bigger sails, uh, put up a spinnaker, etc. So there's all sorts of different ways to crack that particular nut. Um, then into what actually gets the boat to lift up, up off the water. Uh, there are a couple of things that we need to stop misplacing. A lot of people assume that it's what they call equal transit time theory. 
uh, an equal transit time theory is simply on, on a cambered airfoil. It's a longer distance for the air to travel across the top than it is across the bottom. So it spreads out the molecules more. It's less dense, it creates lift because they have to rejoin at the trailing edge. That doesn't work in water because you can't spread out the water molecules across the top of a cambered foil. Um, it just simply is a non-compressible fluid. So equal transit time theory does not work. This works because of Newton's third law and Bernoulli's principle, which basically means that if you push the water down, the boat goes up. It's a simple, it's a, it's a simple uh, uh, force and reaction, right? And here you see uh, the difference between a symmetrical foil and a cambered foil. Uh, and again, this is applied to air. And just so that you can all realize what it is, this is what happens in air. It doesn't happen in the water. So this is, this is what people often assume is causing the lift and the boats to fly, and it's not, okay? It's just simply, you know, you take a plate, you push it down, then the water goes up. Uh, sorry, the, the boat goes up, the water goes down. Um, now, obviously the kind of plate you push down can dramatically affect the drag. So yes, as I said at the very top there, flat plate, you can generate lift. You know, you've seen trim tabs on a, on a power boat, uh, but it has lots of drag. If you make them a nice shape, then they can actually generate a lot more uh, force with a lot less drag. Um, here's a nice slide pulling into, into one picture all the different pieces that are at play. Um, so number one is, is that uh, equal transit time theory and it applies to the sail. Okay, so if you look down from the top on the rig and you see the sail, it's got that curve to it and that is exactly what the sail is doing. It's creating lift for you. Um, number two applies to, in this case, they're the J foils that are lifting the boat. And the J foils generate lift because of the, the shape that they are and the fact that you can adjust the angle of attack of those foils. So you adjust them to lift the boat up in the air. And as they lift the boat higher, there is less drag, so the boat goes faster. Uh, but there's also less lift because there's less foil in the water. So they, the, the theory is they become self-modulating. Um, on the moth, they have a wand that monitors the surface of the water so that if you go too high, it turns the foil off. If you're going low, it turns the foil on harder, so it pushes the boat up or down. Here, it's just done by the physical position of the water on the foil. Uh, number three refers to the rudders. So the lifting plane is the horizontal plane, and then turning plane is the vertical plane. And the fourth point over here talks about that angle of attack that I was mentioning. So you can change the angle of attack by moving the top of the board fore and aft, and that will actually change the angle of incidence of the foil. Uh, you can also pull the board up. Um, if you wanna pull the board up, the boat will fly lower, uh, which is very good in flat water or very good in incredibly windy weather when you don't actually wanna fly that high. Uh, quick step. So, apply all that to a, a normal sailboat. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail on this. It's a balancing act. Ha, ha, ha. Um, and you can see there's lots of forces at work. Um, some of the forces that, that folks may not be aware of is that when you have these strange shaped foils, it generates lift that pushes you up to windward and it generates lift that pushes you out of the water. So these were not actually fully foiling boats. Um, but what they were doing is they were doing what we call skimming. So they were lifting a bulk of the, the boat out of the water, but they were also pushing them to windward uh, because of this J-shaped foil. Um, power to weight ratio. You hear lots of people bandy those numbers around and it's like, oh yeah, you've got to have a super light boat with a massive sail on it. And no, you don't. Um, it just depends on how you configure it and how it's sailed. So, a normal laser, which I'm, I'm assuming most people are familiar with, I think it weighs around 60 kilos, got seven square meters of, of sail, its power to weight ratio is 12%. So it has a better power to weight ratio than the current AC-75 boats. Just think on that for a second. Now, very different uh, deployment, and there are lots of different things at play, but that means that you can, you know, within the bounds of this theory, you can actually fly a laser. And there was a photo earlier on uh, with a commercially available foil kit that you can drop into a regular laser. And I think it's around two and a half, three grand with this foil set. And you can go foil in your laser if there's enough breeze and, and you feel like doing that. Why not? Uh, the Moth super lightweight boat, 48 kilos, very light. 
uh, decent sized sail, bigger than a laser, good power to weight. The UFO, not sure if everybody's heard of that. I think we've got one or two in Ottawa. Uh, this is a very easily accessible foiling boat. It's done as a tunnel hull uh, catamaran with a pod in the center for a single daggerboard, single rudder. Uh, it's very light. As we can see, it's about the same weight as a moth and it has a slightly bigger sail than a moth does. So great power to weight ratio. But the nice thing about this is it's wide. So like the moth is that skinny, skinny little hull, you've got a foot of boat with these wings on. The UFO, they've gone, okay, we're gonna make this five feet wide. So when you fall off the foils, which you inevitably do, you don't fall over, you can stay on the boat. In fact, there is a boat. Um, the other nice thing that people don't realize is that a UFO brand new is cheaper than a brand new laser. Um, so those of you that can't afford it, you know, if you're thinking of a new laser or even a used laser, UFO, way to go, right? Easy to put on the car top and all the rest of that. Uh, the F-18, um, I will show you a video of that. I've sailed one of those. That's Greg Johnson, who was with, uh, was supposed to be giving this presentation earlier uh, and, and had to, to bow out. Fabulous platform. Uh, really, really well done. Quite a heavy boat, but quite a big rig and powerful. And it has another 20 square meters for the for the uh, the, the, the Jenica, the Spinnaker. Um, so it's a good power to weight ratio. Uh, the AC-75, we've all seen them on TV. They weigh a ton, well, actually several tons, but they have a massive rig um, and a huge, uh, when they roll out the Jenica, uh, it's a huge Jenica. My boat, the ACAT, again, pretty light, pretty big sail. So the ratios are looking, are looking pretty nice, um, you know, and, it's not just about power to weight. So, you know, you can make most things foil. I think there's a comedy video somewhere on YouTube of an opti foiling. Um, so yeah, you can do it. Uh, so the A-class catamaran, it's a light boat. It's very stiff and it's versatile. So it weighs less than I do, Con considerably less than I do, uh, which makes sailing very interesting. So it's super important where I am on the boat. The reason it needs to be super stiff is because if you imagine a boat uh, that has four lifting foils, which effectively it does, so it has the two dagger boards and the two rudders and it's lifting up, any movement between those foils, either torsionally or longitudinally, will dramatically affect its ability to fly in a stable manner. Um, and also it needs to be able to sail in three knots and 28 knots and six inch waves and six foot waves because you know, I don't want to have a boat pick for any kind of different weather. So it's got to be versatile too. So there's a range of adjustment on there that's quite, quite significant. Um, with the ACAT, you can choose classic or foiler. And the classic is exactly the same platform, just with C boards instead of the, the, the Z boards. Uh, we're now foiling up and downwind, and I'll cover a little bit about, about how that looks. Um, point of entry, like you can jump into uh, uh, foiling um, with about six or seven knots of breeze if you're really good on an ACAT. I uh, currently need about 10 to 11 knots of breeze to get any kind of stability. But what that does is it gives me 12 plus knots of boat speed. And as soon as you're at 12 knots, you can fly. Um, and then really it's, it's all about generating your apparent wind and, and going where you wanna go. Uh, I learned some very hard lessons in my early regattas that uh, VMG, velocity made good, or how quickly you're getting to the windward mark, um, is really non-linear when you're foiling. Um, you know, you can be going 40 degrees higher than a downwind boat or 50 degrees higher than a downwind boat. And if you're going to foil out to the corner and back, you will be first to the leeward mark. Uh, and it's a whole other corner. It's way, way out there. Um, but if you don't foil on the way back, you'll be last. Uh, so that's back to the tactical, looking for your wind, making sure you're, you're, you're sailing within it. Uh, Misha Heemskirk is our, our world champion currently. Uh, he's a big fella, um, but we have a lot of people in the sort of 140 to 150 pound range too, uh, who are definitely not six foot three. So you can actually sail this in a massive range of, of, of people and conditions. And it's back to that versatility. Uh, Tiller anybody who sail a boat, either short-handed or single-handed, you know what a tiller tamer is. You put a piece of string around the tiller or a piece of bungee and you, you rope it off to the side, hold the boat where it is. I have the same thing on, on my ACAT right now. And it's sort of like training wheels because the, 
when you are doing six knots and you twitch away at the wheel, the boat does one of these, you know, gentle little thing. When you're doing 26 knots and you twitch at the tiller, it throws you off the boat and literally and the tiller tame is very important just to try to try to calm that down and you'll see some of that on the, on the video later <clears throat> this is uh, one of the canadian boats down in florida um showing you some of the things that we do in between races and in between days um we're checking foil alignment here so we've got it up on these these work stands the rudders are down the dagger boards are down and we'll be measuring and making sure that everything is relatively uh, set up correctly. So there's a lot of a lot of that kind of stuff going on. Um, I'm not going to cover this in super detail, uh, but suffice to say, if you stick your head out the window of your car when you're doing 60 kilometers an hour, it hurts. And it, you know, if you have any hair, it pulls it around or it throws your sunglasses off or, you know, it'll push you over. And, and that's what it's like on one of these boats. So you have to have aerodynamic treatment underneath the trampoline. You've got to tuck it all away. You've got to have aerodynamic deck level. Um, you know, when you're going that fast, the sail area at the top of the mast typically is just drag. So interestingly, these sails now, they're going back to a pin top idea where there's less drag at the top, more power at the bottom. Um, because when you're doing 22, 24, 28 knots, the top third of the sail is not actually performing any function other than just drag. Um, so, you know, it's it's an interesting boat to sail. There's lots of different things that you can play with. Uh, you can geek out to the max, and it's a very specific thing in the A-class uh, group. There's a view under the trampoline. A um, couple of things going on. <laughs> um, and then what they'll do is they'll put a, 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 an aerodynamic cover over the whole thing. Uh, just so that it doesn't create a lot of windage. Uh, but there's an awful lot of control lines and things that are happening underneath. So my personal journey on this, if you like, was to get in the boat in May 2019, which I did. I bought a boat from a, a guy in Toronto and then end up going to the Worlds, which were scheduled to be last October in 2020. Um, so it was really only 18 months from, from buying the boat to getting to the Worlds. Uh, and I started off with this fabulous winter series down in down in Florida uh, and then COVID hit. And so everything was done. I left my car down there. I left my boat down there. They stayed down there for months and months um, and I couldn't get access to them. They rescheduled the Worlds for April 2022. So it'll be sort of leading up to it this time next year. Uh, so this summer is going to be a busy, busy thing. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Debbie and I are getting married this July too, so it's going to be a busy summer. Um, all that to say, it's a great fleet, lots of good regattas that they do, and they're very supportive, super helpful. Uh, always go fast, don't die. Uh, here I am, set up, ready to go at the uh, 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 St. Petersburg uh, waterfront, uh, and that's where we had the, the North Americans two years ago. So progress. Um, I'm doing a lot of upgrades. I'm learning all about the boat. I'm an engineer. I love it. I've got lots of composites experience. I love that. So I'm applying it all to this boat um, and doing some upgrades, cool stuff. Um, I have uh, got very, um, very much into uh, understanding how that boat could go faster and how I could stay on it and how it doesn't scare me because it did in the beginning. It did scare me a little bit. Uh, the biggest thing is unlearning 50 years of sailing experience. Um, you know, just a couple of things. When you get a gust and you're going downwind, you know, usually people bear off and sheet out and, you know, you, you try to go deeper and faster. Here you bear off, but you sheet in because you're gonna accelerate so much that your apparent wind will swing forward. But if you don't sheet in, you'll actually capsize to windward in the gust. And it's so counterintuitive to what you've learned that it does take some, uh, some, some unlearning to do that. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just show you a couple of a couple of videos of me very early on and then a little bit later on. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing the, this guy. Um, apologies if uh, feel free to talk amongst yourselves or ask a question. Um,
So here we're going to see a movie of me basically uh, in a very early regatta um, in Florida. And I will share it in just a second. Um, okay, so you should be able to see this. So this is now me, I'm wearing a chest, chest cam GoPro. So this is me at the start of this race, um, trying not to get into trouble. I'm closer to the boat end than the pin. Uh, it's probably blowing about 10 to 12 knots, something like that. Uh, so we're not foiling up wind. Um, and you can see things like I've definitely, I'm in chicken mode, I'm on the high trap hook because I don't feel comfortable enough to go on the low trap hook. I don't have my traveler up enough. Uh, it should be center lined. Um, so there's lots of things I'm doing very tentatively. Um, stress on the foil trunk. Um, good question. So maybe in this video we'll see the foil trunks when I get through the tack. Um, you're going to see how bad I am attacking these things in the beginning. Very small space to get through, uh, by the way. <laughs> it's, it's actually a really small triangle at the back of the sail. Um, and then not stalling because you have a unirig, there's no jib, it's kind of hard to uh, to to keep the boat moving forward and keep the foils actually working. So in a second, we're gonna see hopefully the top of the foil trunk. I will pause the video appropriately. Um, so, you know, obviously learning, obviously sailing fairly gently. Um, I just move my hand there. So right now you can see the top of the trunk. It's right in here. Um, and yes, there is a lot of pressure um, on it. Um, and the way that it handles it is it has two bearing plates. It has a bearing plate at the bottom, which is, which is rotational, and it has a bearing plate at the top, which can move fore and aft. And the one at the top is on, on a worm drive, uh, which you can control from, from the wire, from the trapeze. And basically you can either increase or decrease the angle of attack for the foil as you're sailing, and it will do both foils at the same time. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of pressure there because it's not even in a trunk, it's just two plate bearings, top and bottom. Um, but they are made of very strong material and the boards are solid carbon pretty much. Uh, so the, there's a lot of stuff that's handled there. There's a big X frame in here inside the hull and an empty cavity to allow it to uh, be placed inside and out. Um, and now I'm going to let this video run so you can laugh at me while I'm doing terrible things here. Um, wave piercing bows uh, allow you to really push it hard. Um, the, uh, the boat itself is really pretty tough. Like I've been out in this boat in 27, 20, 27 to 30 knots um, at the windward mark and you can dial it down and they are super tough boats. Like, you know, they, they are built strong um, and able to handle this. What I'm doing here is I'm trying to get the thing to foil uh, so we've borne away, the traveler is down, I'm, I'm easing off, um, and I change the attack of the foils. I may come in and try and adjust that again. So a couple of questions. Uh, zero, one, and two holds, what about three? Uh, absolutely. So three, uh, what three holds gives you uh, is flexibility. Um, and there are some foiling tri trimarans. The UFO, uh, Dominic, is really close to being a trimaran. It has that center pod, which has, oh, okay, that's a great indicator. Sorry, I gotta talk us through this, this is funny. <laughs> um, so what's happening here is I'm just starting to foil. And if you watch carefully, as soon as it gets up on its, up, up on its legs, I ease the main sheet, which is absolutely the wrong thing to do. <laughs> so you can watch it again. So she just starts to pop up and I ease the main sheet and boom, it rolls into windward. So you can see the lewid hull is flying um, and the worst thing you can do when you, when you start to fly is ease the main sheet because what happens is that it eases downward pressure on the lewid hull and the lewid hull just takes off and you're on the trapeze on the windward side, you get dumped in the water. Um, so you, you can't depower in a traditional sense. What you have to do is put the boat back down and to do that, you walk forward and manually increase the, or sorry, decrease the angle of attack of the foil so it goes back down onto the water. Um, zero, one, two, and three hulls. Trimarans, yep, uh, a very good form factor for it. It allows a lot of writing moment without too much boat weight. Um, and really it just depends on what you want in terms of real estate on the boat. 
uh, benefits of a foiling tri man, it gives you more space. Uh, it gives you the ability. So here we are around the windward mark. I'm trying to bear off and get it a foil. Um, I can't quite kick it up yet. Just starting to go. Um, almost there. And I get frustrated with that, I think. And then what I do is when the, the breeze eases off, I come back in and, and uh, move the, the dagger board again. Um, so foil development, uh, Steve, you've asked a question about that in the A class. Um, so the boat that I bought was a 2017. Um, it had what they called uh, Z10 foils on the boat. Uh, they're up to Z27s. That doesn't mean that there's been 17 foil developments. There's only been three. Uh, they do a lot of internal development and then jump numbers. Um, so, and, and the other good news is that all of those, there are only three major foil developments in the last five years for this particular boat uh, in terms of the main foil. Uh, they all fit the original trunk. So you don't have to rework the trunk. You don't have to ditch the boat, nothing. All the control systems still work and they design them intentionally like that. Um, some people prefer the old ones, some people prefer the new ones. I've got one in the middle because I don't really know yet. Uh, the rudders, a little bit more development there because the winglets are fairly cheap to muck around with and they're detachable and you can change them as you want. Um, you know, if you invest in a reasonably recent boat, it will be competitive. It's much more like most boats. It's much more about time in the boat. And if you can fly it 10% more than the guy next to you, you're going to do well. Um, yeah. So I'm going to drop out of this video and show you where I've come to um, with the next one. Um, so in this, in this movie, it was taken last October. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and share that so you can see it. You should be able to see that. So this was taken by Greg Johnson, the guy who was supposed to be giving this presentation. Um, and uh, it was a very cold September, October day. I'm in a full wetsuit. I'm pretty tired by now. And it was a southerly, for those of you that know the Ottawa River, and it was savagely gusty. And as anyone who's ever watched any video, um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, uh, it never looks as windy as it felt. Um, and some of those gusts, honestly, it felt like they had lumps in them. Um, so I'm trying to go upwind, actually in safe mode to go home. Um, so we get it dialed up. You can see there's a lot of leech curve. This is what I was talking about. The top of the sail doesn't do a lot when you get to go really fast. I must be just wimping out and not pulling hard enough on the, on the main sheet because there is no vang. I am the vang. Anyway, um, it's into skimming mode here because I didn't want it to fly. It was too gusty to fly safely. Um, but you can see how it's set up. It's actually a very nice shot of the wing style of the sail uh, and how, how all that goes. Um, and upwind, you know, without foiling, probably doing 16-ish knots. Uh, if you start to foil upwind, the way to foil upwind um, is, again, it's all about pressure on that leeward hull. Uh, the rig is, is, is pressing down. Uh, obviously, the, 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 the rotation from the rig is, is going this way. The, the, the downforce on this hull is significant. And the dagger board in this hull is trying to lift it up. If it tries it might, it can't do it because there's too much pressure on there. So what you do to upwind foil is you bear away about 10 degrees. So just foot off a little bit, get some speed up, and then you dump an armful of main sheet and then the lewd hull pops up. As soon as it pops up, you sheet back in again. Otherwise it'll keep going up and up and up and you'll go in the drink to windward. Um, so the windward foiling is a little bit of a knack that I have yet to master. Um, anyhow, there we see a little, a little bit of an improvement from Bluster on the Bay. I'm understanding a lot more about the boat. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, I realize we're, we're going pretty long here, so I don't want to, uh, to, to uh, run out of time. Um, so what I will do now is I will go back to the presentation uh, here. There we go. And we'll do a new share. Um, we'll go back to this guy. Okay. We're, we're almost getting there. 
Um, okay. Um, so now costs. Um, if we talk about costs, you know, we all spend money on these things. Uh, and it's just how much do you want to spend? Um, so I'm being cards on the table here. My boat cost me around 25K. Uh, it was two years old when I got it, had pretty much all the good stuff on it. Needed a new trampoline. Um, <clears throat> I chose to put a new set of foils in it that were used that I bought for you know a few hundred dollars, not six grand. That's for two rudders and two dagger boards, by the way. Uh, new mainsails, about 3K, they're, they're built. Um, they're very rugged sails but they are somewhat uh, susceptible to damage if you don't treat them properly. Um, when I was down in Florida, you know, I flew in, flew out, Airbnb, lived cheaply, cooked for myself. Uh, the regattas themselves are cheap. And so doing, I think I had eight regattas planned. It was gonna be about a thousand bucks a regatta to go there and back every time. Um, and obviously I drove down for the first one, flew in, flew out as I needed, and then drove back for the last one. Uh, and you've got to spend your money on something, right? Um, so <laughs> takeoffs are optional. You don't have to foil. You know, even in a foiling AK, you don't have to foil. Uh, but if you do, you got to land, okay? Um, so, you know, the lesson there is, is just be brave enough to suck at it. It's okay. Give it a go because it is worth it. It's spectacular. Um, and, you know, you never actually learn any of these really cool things or life lessons by being too careful. So, so there's there's the, uh, the, the the dichotomy, I guess you'd call it. Um, so yeah, is it poor judgment that I go on? Absolutely not. Does it hurt sometimes? Absolutely. Um, you know, I I realize that very much ibuprofen is a fact of life, uh, and I have to do these things and and experience them. And you know, there'll come a time when I can't or I don't want to, and then I'll move on to something else. But for now, this is a great way to experience foiling. There are lots of other foilers in. The, uh, in the fleet here. Actually, I should do this. Um, let me just pick up the, there's an F-18. This is the, this, so Greg Johnson, who was gonna give the, the presentation, uh, this was me and him out on his, uh, on his boat. So let me just grab that and uh, I will share that. It is worth a quick look because there's some entertaining things and you'll, as I talk you through it, you'll see what's, what's happening. So I think everybody can see that. You make it nice and good. Um, this is an F-18. So it's a standard F-18. If you put non-foiling boards in it, it can race as an F-18. Um, <clears throat> here we are and you can see um, uh, you know, we're learning from each other. We're trying to figure out, I'm trying to figure out what he's doing with main sheet trimming because I'm not doing that. Um, there is, uh, this feels like a Cadillac compared to a bit of a race car. The ACAT feels a bit like a race car. This feels a bit like a Cadillac. Um, it's super flattering. It's very, very easy to figure out how to sail it. And it's incredibly forgiving as you will see shortly. Um, so what we're doing, we're going upwind, we're just figuring stuff out. Um, then we get to the hoist point, uh, spinnaker up. Um, so we're putting the spinnaker up. Uh, so how about handicaps against ordinary tornadoes at NSC? So a regular tornado, one that doesn't have the kite, uh, I got to beat you by quite a long way. Um, if it's a tornado with a kite, I'm not sure. I think it's fairly close. And the trouble is with handicaps across multi-classes is that you will, um, I'm just gonna pause this for a second, is that you will, will get tremendously different uh, results, strength, because certain boats are better in certain way. You know, handicap is, a, is an imperfect system in an imperfect world. Um, what is a reasonable budget to get a good enough foiling rig, assume used, and where would you look for one? Uh, so that, question i'm not sure what boat you're talking about but if you wanted to go kite foiling you know you can pick up a used kite foiling rig for probably under a thousand bucks if you want to pick up uh, a used a cat that is foiling you're probably looking around 15 uh, entry point for something decent you, 
you might even get it, get it a little less. The beauty about the ACAT is it is a savagely fast developmental class. And the guys at the top like to change their boats often. And that has a real, that's one of the times when trickle down economics does actually work for us. Uh, so we do get really quite good boats at not too much money. Um, and where would you look for one? Get on, get on the national websites, like the USA Cat Association has fabulous uh, uh, adverts written on there. And typically when the border is open, it's super easy to go get boats and, and pick one up at a, a regatta. Um, if you want to look at other boats for that, the F-101 is down in Kingston. Uh, it's a slightly different proposition. There are no used ones yet. Um, UFO is super cheap uh, and super easy. You know, you put it on top of your car, it doesn't need a trailer. Uh, it comes in at around probably eight, nine K for a brand new boat. Uh, and there are enough of them out there now that you may even get a used one. Um, ask me later if, if, uh, if I've not answered that question, Peter. Uh, conscious of time, I'm just gonna zip through this, this video. So now we're at 20 knots and I'm just sitting. I'm sitting on the gunnel, Greg is in flat wiring. And you can see occasionally we'll fly the Lewitt hull. I'm still learning where the steering is. So there's the Lewitt hull up properly. I get scared and I put it back down to skimming mode, right? But we get a gust and then now we're flying both up. And then you put it down and sometimes you put it down on purpose and sometimes you don't. Um, so that was a fairly hard landing. Uh, here we are on the other tack having jibed round and there are some savage gusts. If you look at the, the bow pole, the way it gets pulled around, um, there are some wicked gusts that came through here. Uh, thanks for that, John. US, uh, US uh, price on UFO is 7,900. So still under 10 grand. Um, <clears throat> so here we are, 20 knots. Um, and again, sitting down. The reason I'm sitting down is to limit my steering so that I don't oversteer the boat. And also because, uh, there we go. And that's 23.1, right? That's the fastest we went that day. Um, wasn't trapezing other than the fact I was learning and I you know, hold my hand up and say, yep, I was a little bit nervous. Um, there are no foot straps on, on this boat and I won't go out there without a foot strap in this kind of condition. Um, anyway, you'll see us landed in a second and, uh, and, then, and then there we are. But uh, you know, there's lots of different ways to get into it and come down to the yard. I know Greg is very keen to get young people on these boats, on this one that you see right here. Um, now look at that. So we've stuffed the bows royally. We're just gonna show that again. Um, pretty damn hard and the boat just popped right up. Just watch, I get it wrong. Oh, down we go. Boom, throws Greg all the way up front, throws me down the trampoline. You know, nobody fell off. We went fast and we didn't die. Um, what a concept. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a pretty forgiving boat. And I know Greg is, is open to, to getting people onto this boat. You can buy in as part of a, uh, a consortium. So, I'm not sure what the price is per, per season, but it's very, very reasonable. And basically what it does, it just offsets his uh, insurance and, and damage repairs, um, but highly worthwhile doing. Come down to the dinghy, uh, talk to family, uh, whatever, whatever you want. So I'm gonna go back to sharing my presentation um, here. Uh, lots of thanks. Uh, uh, um, you can all read that. Um, no foiling. Give it a try. You know, what do you got to lose, really? Um, yeah, so questions. You're welcome, Brian. Happy to do this. In terms of uh, uh, the competitors at the regattas in Florida, good question, John. Um, we, we ranged from 25 boats to 75 boats. So we had the North Americans in St. Petersburg, right off of the, the park in, in town and uh, St. Petersburg Yacht Club hosted and it was a fabulous affair. Um, 75 boats entered a mix of foilers and non-foilers. Um, and then there were a couple of ones where we went to the right coast over on the Atlantic side down and down in, in Florida. And those, those were down to 25, 28 boats, something like that. Again, a mix of about 50, 50 foilers, non-foilers. Uh, there are some regattas in, in Canada. As I said, there's that multi-foiling regatta in July. Uh, of course, the Skiff and Cat Grand Prix at Nepean, which is the first weekend in June every year. And all this is obviously uh, COVID. Uh, um, there are also Serrano on Lake Ontario area. I know the, the water rats and, and the various catamaran fleets down there, very active F-18 fleets. 
um, you know, we could go and join in, in with those guys. Um, they are talking about an NA in 2023 in Canada. Um, so we may be pitching for Kingston. Uh, it would be on, on the east side. So yeah, there's lots of regattas uh, to, to go to in Canada. We're fortunate there are, are a fairly solid core of ACAT sailors in Toronto who have no problem traveling. Uh, and it's centered around three brothers, the Woods brothers who are pretty legendary in sailing circles. Uh, and they um, travel together. They all sail foiling ACATs. And all three of them are air traffic controllers at Pearson. Um, go figure. <laughs> they would have had lots of time recently. Yeah, yeah, they have had a lot more time recently. Um, so I saw a flash up of how to join the mailing list. Um, just uh, send myself or Matt Davidge or somebody like that a, a request, and we'll stick you on the uh, on the Ottawa Catamaran mailing fleet. Um, if you want to be on the NSC mailing fleet, and you remember, you should be. And, and if you're not, you should just ask Julie. And if you so I think that, that's it. I don't see any more questions. We're getting some difficulties with the sound. I think it's uh, uh, you're oh, cutting okay. out every once in a while, but I think we've got the gist of everything you've uh, said. Uh, okay. Are there still questions here or not? No. Just congratulations on a very interesting topic. <laughs> so it's rather interesting, uh, even from my perspective, because I was going to listen to Greg Johnson and he his whole pitch was slated to people not in my age bracket. He, <laughs> He wanted to talk about uh, getting young people interested in foiling sailboats, and you basically yep. uh, renewed my interest in the whole topic by saying that there's room for old people too. Well, there are. There are there's room for everyone, really. Um, and you know, I, I'm not 20, and I'm not made of rubber, and you know, I don't work for Cirque du Soleil. And if I can do it, most people who are able-bodied sailors can do it. Uh, I am noticing a couple of questions. Um, the pinhead main peculiar to the A-class cat since the A-75 is not. Uh, that's from Tom Winlow. Um, the A-75s have had some interesting different sails. The bat wing sail is a variation on the pinhead. Uh, they're only allowed a certain amount of area. And what they're doing is they're reducing the area on the top of the sail and increasing the, the length of the battens to allow a stiffness and, and response in the top. On sale. This kind of a version of a pinhead. Um, what else do we have in here? Uh, <laughs> sharing the embarrassing moments. At the moment, Aaron, that's pretty much all I have <laughs> is embarrassing moments. But you got to, you know, you got to keep keep plugging away, right? Um, so, is there a boat that would be suitable for a cottage sailing, and where can you purchase them? So, it's always about your confidence and comfort on any given boat. Um, if you want to sail at the cottage, uh, you know, something like the UFO is a great solution for that because it's standalone, it's super light, easy to handle, you can pop it on the roof of the car, just needs a little dolly to get it in the water, you can rig it, uh, it doesn't have any stays, it has a Windsor style rig um, with, uh, with diamonds and uh, a wishbone boom, and it's very reasonably priced, um, you know, and if you're lighter, it's a really good platform. I have sailed one, I'm a little on the heavy side for them and so would need more wind. So take a, an honest look at your lake or wherever you're gonna, gonna sail this. And if there's, you know, regularly it's always four to three knots, you're probably not gonna go foiling, you know, buy a radio control model and see if you can do it with that. But, you know, if you regularly get six to 10 knots, then, and, and maybe maybe for the kids or for, for, for smaller adults, a UFO would be a really good solution for that. Um, the uh, F101, which is a new foiler that's come out, that's a trimaran foiler. Somebody was mentioning trimarans earlier. Um, that be able to foil in six to seven. Um, is the UFO a practical boat for the youth sailing school? Uh, <laughs> yes, it is. 
I, I would suggest, and it's a great introduction because it's a pretty robust hull. The one thing that I, I would be a little concerned about perhaps is the robustness of the rig. Uh, it's, it's quite a, uh, a delicately built rig. Anyway, um, but yeah, we can talk about that later. Uh, yeah. Anyone else, I guess? Oh, there's people that like saying something on chat here too. Yeah, there's lots of. Uh, oh yeah, okay. Um, so W, whoever is that, I'm not gonna post my email on this cause I don't know who's on it. Um, <laughs> but you can reach me on the uh, actually uh, public relations at nsc.ca, public relations at nsc.ca, that, that will get to me. Very good. Cool. Okay, well, I think that's the end of the questions there, Dave. So uh, okay. again, thank you very much on behalf of uh, all the comments that I've seen coming in here. Um, many of them are uh, complimenting you on uh, all the uh, stories that you've uh, presented here tonight. Your honesty as well, talking about what's happened and uh, how you deal with it and so on. So uh, appreciate that. And you know, each and every week we have been giving away some swag, but I feel rather ill at ease giving it to the person that eventually will be supplying it to all the other speakers. So a hat for <laughs> right. you that you are going to give me and I can give back to you. Same sort of silly, but in any case, it's here. And Julie will have your name. And we promise yeah, tell we'll you what, it to you. I'll, I'll, I'll give that hat to whoever's on this, this presentation that steps up and gets on that F-18 with Greg for a sale. The first person that does that in this season, they get the hat. <laughs> Very good. I'll, I'll make sure that Julie gets it to you and you can get it to that person. Done. <laughs> Very good. So thank you again, David, for your time and the presentation. You. Uh, that's really neat. So, Thanks. So thank you very much. Thanks again, David. Good night, everybody.